You know, when I set out to create what has become my pizza, and I'm very clear in saying my pizza, because you can't define it. You, you can't say, oh, it's a deep dish pizza, or it's a Chicago pizza, or it's a Neapolitan, or it's a Detroit, or it's whatever you want to say, it's my pizza. That's really important. In my approach to what was going to become my signature dough, was that I approached it as a bread maker. Um, and it was very important for me to bring into my pizza dough all the characteristics that I tried to bring into my sourdough loaf. There was color in a dough. There was fermentation bubbles. Most important to me, if it's a good dough day, you will see that structure of the inside of a properly made sourdough loaf with the open hole structure. I would say my pizza is really pizza dough made from the eyes and the soul of a bread maker. I have to say, and I've said it many times before, that back in early 2000, I think, might be late 1990s. I had the pleasure of being invited to Suzanne Goen's wedding in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, and she held it at Chris Bianco's Pizzeria. And it was there when I tasted his pizza, I knew right away that one day I too was going to create my own pizza. And people have to remember all the time that they are working with a product that's alive and every day it's going to be different. So rejoice in the good days and when it's not such a good day, just remember that that pizza is always edible. Hello everybody, my name is Steve Delinsky. I'm the founder of Pizza City Fest Los Angeles. All right, thank you. We had to hear from the queen of pizza in Los Angeles, Nancy Silverton, uh, because we invited her, of course. She was the first person I reached out to. But she is in Cagliazzo, Italy, this weekend, cooking at the 10th anniversary of Pepe and Grani, Franco Pepe's famous pizzeria there. So she's not in Los Angeles. Uh, but I did talk to her at Mozza a couple weeks ago. I wanted to get her take on dough. That was very important as we talk about how important dough is to making pizza. Um, I'm so excited that this panel is with us today. Uh, these are just the all-stars uh, in L.A. And I'm going to get out of the way. We're going to go for about 45 minutes and take your questions at the end. I'm going to turn over the floor to Noel Broner from Slow Rise Pizza. If you don't follow Noel, you should on Instagram. Slow Rise Pizza, he can for a lot of folks throughout L.A. and beyond. Uh, he'll be leading the discussion today. Noel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Steve Delinsky. Hi, everybody. I'm going to stand up if you don't mind. I've been sitting for a long time. I just flew in from Argentina. No, no joke there. 22 hours sitting, so I'm going to stand. So thank you for coming. Um, I'll be around at the booth right next door at the CoLab Lab for the next two days. If you want to drop by and talk pizza with me, I'm, I'm ready to go. Um, Steve Delinsky said I could uh, lead a panel discussion uh, today about anything I wanted. And so I said, can I invite anybody I want? And they said, yes. And I said, you mean anybody? And I said, yeah. I said, yeah. So I've got three of my favorite dough people here. And I don't know how much you know about them, but they're some of my favorites. So without introduction, I'm going to bring on Evan and Andy and Daniele. And we're not going to talk about pineapple and pizza. If you want to ask us about that at the end, you're welcome to. But we're going to talk about dough. Dough is near and dear to my heart. I got to say, I'm not from Italy. I'm not from New York. My parents are from New York and Chicago, so I kind of grew up in a pizza war zone. But I'm from L.A., and honestly, I grew up like a latchkey kid. I, I grew up eating frozen pizza, so I'm not steeped like Daniele in like the history of Naples pizza, right? Andy here grew up in New Jersey, right? I say the best New York pizza is in New Jersey right now, right? So I'm not the only one. New Jersey in the house? There you go. Um, and then we've got Evan Funky here. Evan is uh, one of my favorite chefs. I was just at the opening of his, of his new restaurant, Funky in Beverly Hills. He is a sixth generation Californian, true or not true, sir? Very true. Very true. So I'm, I'm gonna start with Evan and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna mention something that I, we were talking about backstage and, and the other night. I went to the opening of his restaurant, everything was on point, but Evan wasn't happy with the dough the first night. Nope. So for those of you who are making pizza at home and you're not happy with your dough one night, you're not the only one. Evan, what happened the other night? Well, first of all, the worst thing that can happen is pizza. So everything's going to be okay. I mean, <clears throat> you have to realize for me, 
pizza and pasta is very much an animal. It lives, it breathes. It's directly affected by its immediate environment. So monitoring and being aware of the environment that the pizza is living in is very important. On top of that, if you're using wood fire, that's an additional animal that you have to control, or at least try to dance with. So the dough is the animal, the fire is the animal. He can talk about that a little bit more, being from Naples. But uh, dough is, is everything. And uh, you can go as molecular and as you know, atomic as you want, all the way down into the formula. But for me, <clears throat> Bread, pizza, pasta, it's all math. And I, I wish to God that I had paid more attention in math class because if I knew how much fucking math I would do on a daily basis, I would have paid more attention. Good point. I've been teaching pizza classes on Zoom for about two years, ever since the pandemic started. And I had Adam Kuban on. If you guys know him, he's doing uh, you know, pan-style pizza from New York. And he was teaching all the classes with his very precocious third-grade daughter, Margot. And I used to say that guys, it's only third grade math. And she's like, actually, Noel, it's second grade math. I'm like, really, Margot? Addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, but not long division. Apparently, that's second grade math these days. So he's right, but it doesn't, you don't have to be a genius, right? You do not. You just have to have a scale and patience. I like it's all that. measurement. Good. Daniele, you, dis you would disagree with that. For you, pizza's all feel. Am I correct? It's not that I disagree. I, I, I mean... You can buy all the books in the, in the world. You can, right? You can study and be over there and, uh, you know, having an amazing time understanding hydration, understanding the relation between P and L, you know, sensibility, uh, you know. And, but at the end of the day, this is a job that you got to do it. I mean, if you don't wake up in the morning, you get your hands dirty. I've been doing this job since I was nine years old. I woke up. Uh, at 4 a.m. in the morning to help my family making bread. And how I started to, to, to make bread was uh, uh, with, the, with the, the eye of a kid that doesn't understand second grade math. So uh, I just saw all my family around this beautiful wooden bean, we call it Madia in, uh, in Naples, uh, Amatra in, uh, in the in dialect. And everybody was playing with the sticky stuff. Sticky stuff for a nine years old. You know what it means, right? So I want to play with the freaking sticky stuff too. Why everybody's having fun and I'm not allowed to do it. So I start to have my hands dirty. And then so, uh, that's how my passion for bread became. But I had an auntie that uh, I still have it. She never went to school. She doesn't even know how to write uh, uh, her name. She signed with an X. So and do you, anytime that I will ask her, how do you do this? How do you do? Do you have a recipe? And so the answer of my auntie was like, God, you just do it. Don't worry about it. Just do it. You weigh the salt. Weigh. No, don't weigh anything. Just taste everything as you go. So that's my experience as a, as a child. Then you grow up, you know, and there is technology, right? There's refrigerations. There is, uh, 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 there is yeast that has been uh, uh, dried. There's chemical yeast. There's natural yeast. Uh, there is biga, now there is pat fermenté, there is all these beautiful techniques that are part of all over the world. You just got to choose what you want to do and apply it to your job. For me, I was lucky enough to be born in a family that was ignorant of uh, math and, uh, you know, it's just tradition. In Italy, there is a lot of, Evan went to Italy so many times, you know that it's like that. There's a lot of people that do stuff and they don't even know how they do it. It's just, magic. Yeah. So... I was lucky enough to be born in a family where my mom was a chef, my grandpa was a pastry chef on cruise ships, and my auntie was, uh, was happened to be uh, a bread baker. And she gave me this beautiful starter, which is called crescido. And to answer to you, crescido is basically a sourdough with salt. So, so everybody knows what we're talking about. So it doesn't go sour because the salt controls the pH, so it keeps it low. And uh, you have this actually sweetness note of the flour instead of the sour note. That's what I do at Pizzana. So I refresh the dough every day, and I do it because of uh, m muscle memory. If I had to explain to you each things that I do, I tried. I have a book. It's sold on a, <laughs> on a stand over there. If you guys want to go in you know, and go buy it, just go. But, you know, I do it because I do this job since I was nine years old, and I do it every day. So I encourage people to just wake up in the morning, 
If you love pizza, you love dough, you love bread like I do, and I have belly to prove it, just do it. Just go, have, make your hands dirty, do it, and trust me, you're going to have fun. I love it. I love it. I'd like to bring Andy Caden into this uh, conversation. Hello, Andy. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Andy is the owner of a multitude of businesses, but I met you when you just had Bub and Grandma's, right? That's correct. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. You got into this business to make sandwiches, and na only now have you been starting to make sandwiches. Yes, it is. It it's, uh, was a seven-year bread-related blackout it's that uh, it, that I had to go through in order to get back to the sandwiches. But now we have the bread to put the sandwiches within. So that's that's very good. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. You're not Italian. I am. I am a Jew from New Jersey. What? And you make bread and pizza. I make. Yeah, I make a lot of different things, yes. So tell us how you met Nancy Silverton, because I feel like that's important. Not, it's not an important part of why I brought you in, but I think it's, it's interesting. Yeah, uh, well, our, we, we started in, we, I started in my house in Mount Washington 15 minutes from here about eight years ago, just making bread so that I could talk to somebody who already is a bread baker about what I wanted them to make for me so I could have a sandwich up. Um, but unfortunately, unfortunately, the bread on its own um, had its own path. So we, we followed that path and um, are a wholesaler now and sell bread to 150 restaurants around Los Angeles. It's taken a long time to get there. But through that process, um, our, our second head baker that we hired uh, came via Moza. And uh, Nancy reached out about us taking over all of the bread for all the Moza restaurants, which was sort of an um, unfathomable step in the growth of the, of the business. Um, and once we did that and used, you know, that was a springboard to graduating to a larger bakery, we then took over all the pizza dough for Pizzeria Moza um, and uh, Kispaka and a variety of other things, working at first with Nancy's recipe and then developing it over time to make something that both of us were really happy with. But yeah, that's the, that's the Nancy tale. That's a pretty awesome story. It's yeah, very, very honored to work with her. So how did you get into um, you know, the love of dough? I have a, uh, as I would imagine these two do as well, and a lot of chefs in the world, uh, an obsessive nature. Um, and if I am working on something I have to repeat it over and over and over and over again until I get to a place where it makes sense to me and I have control over it. Um, and unfortunately for home pizza cooks and bread bakers, unless you are doing it on that daily repetition like Danielle was talking about, it's very difficult to wrangle dough related products. Unless you are really seeing the development day by day, seeing how the humidity, the temperature, everything that's going on in, in the environment that you're producing the dough changes the dough, it's going to be very difficult to get the desired product that you want, unless you are, you know, hands deep in it every single day. So best of luck to all of you. But uh, uh, it, it uh, both uplifts life and destroys life, the, the, the dough way. But yeah, that's kind of how it happens. I like that. Raise your hand if you make pizza at home. Excellent. Raise your hand if you have uh, aspirations to go beyond your home and maybe make pizza somewhere else one day. Look at that, right? Excellent. How many of you guys raised your hand over here? I like it. So here's something that I find. When I was, when I was, when I was you guys 15 years ago, sitting in those seats, thinking one day I want to be up here, that's never actually what I thought, but I, I am up here now. It wasn't the plan. I thought, man, what do, guys, what do those guys know that, that I don't know, right? And actually, I don't think there's really anything. I think what happened was that we caught the bug. We started making pizza every day. We found people that were just dumb enough to invest in us. And we still just make pizza every day, but it's not always that great. And whether you have a dough that's a B minus or a B plus or a C minus or an A plus, you still got to make pizza, right? So I wonder if we have any advice for people sitting out there. I'll start with you, Evan, since you're closest to me. If you have, do you have any advice for people who, even if they don't want to open a pizzeria, if they just want to make awesome pizza for their friends and family, where do you start? Well, first of all, the dough senses fear. Okay? It senses fear. Absolutely. It's going to know. Treat it like an animal. Okay? You have to give bread rules. You have to give it rules. You need structure. It needs discipline. It needs repetitive, repetitive love. If you give it rules, it will learn about you, and you will learn about it. 
and that's all that it is. That's for real. You got to give it rules. Same thing every day, same temp, same hydration, same flower. You got to pay attention to the details. And it's going to speak to you. It's going to tell you, I'm dry, I'm too wet, I'm too tight, I'm too extensible. It's going to talk to you. You just have to learn the language. You can't learn the language unless you pay attention to it. And you can't learn the language unless you do it every fucking day. Every day. Even on Sunday. And that's really it. And, and it's, it's going to be a journey. It's going to be a journey. And it's never going to be the same. That is the one constant with pizza dough. It's never the same. It's a journey with no destination. Correct. Just like excellence. Andy, any advice for people sitting out there? On I mean, exactly what he was talking about. If it's not just giving the dough rules, you have to give yourself rules. Because if you, for one day, decide to do something a little bit different in your own life, then the dough will reflect that. And you have to abide by the, the, the uh, rules of the dough. If you step outside of that, then you're going to get a result that is not in line with what the rules typically produce. And you also, in that moment, won't learn anything. Because if it's not the same every day, you won't know what you're making changes to affect. So regulated schedule is super important for yourself and for the dough. And then um, you're able to you know, make adjustments to try and get to what you want. But if you don't have that focus and dedication and sick obsessiveness, uh, it makes things very difficult to achieve the goal you're looking for. I'll add to that something really quickly. The only way to truly know something is to completely fuck it up and then try it again. That's the only way you know how to troubleshoot it. You just have to again and again and again and again. You got to know it upside down, backwards, forwards. And you got to, it's just, you have to fail and you have to give your space and grace to fail. Again, the worst thing that's going to happen is pizza. Daniele, how about you? The worst thing that's going to happen is pizza. You're still going to have a meal, so it's good. So I'm, uh, well, I can give you the point of view as an immigrant because when I came over here, I'm from Naples, and uh, we are uh, fellow Neapolitan over there. Uh, so I hate when people put a, a label on, especially on me where I come from, it's like, uh, you're from Naples, you gotta do Neapolitan pizza, right? It's like, I honestly, I grew up between Naples and Caserta, and uh, those two cities are very similar, but so different. So with my auntie, we used to do this dough that uh, is baked in a, a bread, a bread oven, right? Bread oven usually has the mouth of the oven is uh, higher. So there is a lot more dispersion of uh, heat uh, because you have to introduce more moisture into the dough. So you have uh, pots and pans of, uh, of water that are boiling to create steam. It's not like right now we have this beautiful oven there. You push a button and there's shh, beautiful steam is coming out. So basically, I used to, uh, like, even my, my auntie still had that uh, little uh, pocket of water that you have to push and the water comes out. I remember since I was a kid. Uh, it's a very rural uh, little town that I come from, San Marco Evangelista. And it's a town stopped in the 700, that's what I said. It's like there's still like old uh, little uh, ladies outside the city then uh, on the chair smoking cigarettes and talking about shit about everybody in the, in the city. So that's, that's the little city that I come from. So uh, and when I came in, the, in Los Angeles, everybody, everybody told me the same thing. Every Italian, every Los Angelino is like, it's impossible to make a good pizza in Los Angeles. The water sucks. The weather sucks. You suck. Everybody sucks. <laughs> and I was so scared of trying to make a pizza. Then the first time that I tried to make it, my pizza sucked. Literally sucked. It's, oh my God, now I cannot make my living. So, but what I did, I just called my auntie and she told me, just do what you used to do over here. I said, yeah, it's easy for you because you go by feeling. You're doing this job since you were nine years old. You go by feeling too. So I started to adjust. I started to uh, repeat the same dough every day. Maybe more water, maybe less water, maybe more yeast, maybe less yeast, uh, more starter, less starter. And I adjusted. But the goal was to recreate 
uh, a memory, right? A, a memory that I, have of, that I had of a door that was important for me. So the advice I can give you guys, when you start to make a pizza, decide, decide already what pizza you guys want to make. And don't worry about the style. New York style, New Jersey style, Detroit style. Do what you like, what is meaningful for you. Because if you first like it, you're going to be a better storyteller for the people that you're going to serve the pizza. So that's the advice that I can give to people. Beautiful. I'll just chime in. When I, was, when I was up and coming, what I like to do was approach chefs with my pizza or bread and have them try it, preferably in front of me so I could either f mostly fail because most chefs, if, if they're smart, they're not going to compliment you. They're going to they're gonna tear you down first and then build you back up the way they want to. So, but for instance, I went to, I went to Pizzana during, during the opening. I think I was there for friends and family, and I didn't want to go. I went kicking and screaming. The last thing I wanted was another Neapolitan pizza. <laughs> But I met Daniele, and his pizza was insane. We talked for like 30 seconds. I think we talked about Charlie Parker, Thelonious Monk, our love of jazz. And I said, I'm yep. coming tomorrow, and I'm bringing you a, a loaf of bread. And I went back home, and the only dough I had was eight days old. And I'm like, I'm going to make it work. And I baked off these over-fermented, beautiful loaves of bread, and I brought him one. And after that, we were friends because he really appreciated what I baked in my little home oven. And I have the worst oven in the world. I have a rental apartment in Santa Monica. I have a Whirlpool oven. The, I was, the pizza stone's more expensive than the oven. Put it I that still way. remember what I did with those loaves. Uh, I cut it in half, I put Nutella in it, and I put it in a panini press. <laughs> it was like a croissant. It was so good. Yeah. And how about this? I remember I ran into Evan Funky at the farmer's market. For me, he was a famous chef. I was nobody, right? And he said, I really love what you're doing. I guess we were following each other on Instagram. And I'm like, oh, my God, Evan Funky loves what I'm doing. Chef, can I invite you to my house for, for lunch sometime? He's like, yeah, invite me. So Evan Funky came over to my little rinky-dinky apartment in Santa Monica, sat at my table. My wife's in, like, the back office, like, oh, my God, Evan Funky's here. And I <laughs> served you my version of Roman pizza. And he gave me some really good feedback. And, and after that, I felt like... This guy is awesome. Like, he came to my house for lunch. He didn't, who am I? You know, I was just some guy at the farmer's market being like, dude, you're awesome. Would you ever come to my house for, for pizza? He's like, I'll come to your house for pizza. I will go anywhere for pizza. <laughs> Especially your house. Yeah, so don't be afraid to approach chefs with your, with your pizza because they might give you some valuable feedback. And you might be surprised. They might really like it. Right? Andy, did you, um, did you approach any, any, any mentors or any bakers or chefs when you were, when you were coming up? No. Uh, I, we were, I was just too blacked out with the, the business to do anything other than just make the stuff. And um, we've been very lucky in that as a, as a wholesale bakery that sells to rest, almost entirely restaurants and markets, We've never done any press. We've never done any marketing or PR or anything like that and just have grown organically, which is um, really makes me feel good um, that it's literally just the product and people's opinion of it that allows um, uh, access to more people's mouths and, and more people's opinions and um, keeps it as pure as humanly possible. I feel uncomfortable selling anything just in general and the fact that we can sell it without having to try to convince people that it's good is, is, a, is a really fantastic feeling. Let, let me go back to the crowd. I have a question for you. Who thinks that pizza and bread are kind of two of the same thing but a little different? Raise your hand if you think pizza and bread are like kissing cousins. Good. Raise your hand if you think pizza is one thing and bread is another. Interesting. All right. So, Chef, let's start with you. What, what is the relationship in your mind between pizza and bread? I don't know if they're... Maybe they're cousins. Are they kissing cousins? That's just weird, bro. <laughs> Do they make out a lot? <laughs> I mean... Pizza for me is uh, the, you know, Italy's first fast food. Yeah. Napolitana. It's in the oven, 1,200 degrees. It's out in under 60 seconds. That is not bread. Bread takes a long time to make, pre-shape, final shape, proofing, scoring, baking, steaming, venting, etc., etc. It's a much, much longer process. Are they made from the same stuff and kind of act the same way? Sure, but it's definitely not the same thing. 
Daniela, you started out as a bread baker. Now you're known as a pizza maker. What's the relationship between pizza and bread? I can give you a very historical question about that. So the first pizza wasn't even a pizza, it was a focaccia. So the word pizza means, you know, means flattening out the dough. That's where the, the word come from. So pizza were little try out to understand what temperature was the oven when the thermometer wasn't invented. So before to make bread, you heat up the flame, you put the oven at a very high temperature, and then slowly, slowly, slowly goes down. And then there is uh, two tricks, artisanal tricks that I learned from my artisanal family. One is you grab a little flour, you put it on, uh, on the floor, and you count how much time it takes to burn, right? So you know approximately what, uh, what temperature is the, 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 the floor of the oven. The other one is you can splash your water and you see if it steams right away or it's like the bubbles keeps uh, repeating itself uh, during more separation of time. So it takes more time. That's very rural. That's very prehistoric. Uh, that's how I learned to manage the oven without thermometer and, uh, and nothing. But there is another technique is to take a little bit of dough, flatten it out, put it in the oven and see which spot cooks the most so you know exactly where to put the first loaf of bread and rotating it. So to don't throw away those little proofing uh, dough, we used to dress it with a little bit of lard, garlic, and herbs. And th that was the first pizza that was invented. It was called Mastu Nicola. And that was sold on the little street in Naples. Then tomato came, and then it became uh, pizza with tomato sauce. And uh, I think something similar uh, started in Spain, too, in Valencia, something that are called coca. So if you, f if you think about it, in, in uh, air measurement, Valencia and Naples are on the same uh, parallel. So, so there's something that uh, is very similar about those two te techniques of making bread. So where it was born, 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 I'm not sure. But I know that for sure pizza was uh, uh, something to preserve bread. It's like, okay, I'm going to try out to, to see the temperature of the oven. I'm not going to throw away the bread. And I'm going to sell out a flat bread. So that's how pizza was born. Mr. New Jersey? Uh, bread, uh, as starting as a bread baker and a bread producer, the main thing that jumps out at me off, just off the top of my head is that bakers, bread bakers have a much shittier work schedule. <laughs> um, and p pizza's at night and bread is in the dark of morn. Um, and it's just part of the lifestyle. If you commit um, to that way of being, if you fall in love with, with bread specifically in the way that I did and the way that our bakers do, it, you know, it's a alternative way of living. You have to commit to it. Um, I mean, in the same way that pizza is, if you're operating a restaurant at night, that's also an alternative way of living um, from the way that the general masses, for the most part, live. Um, and it's, it is a, uh, not only just a way of life in terms of when the businesses operate, but a way of life in terms of dedication to the product that you've made your own. Um, so that, that's the first thing that jumps out to me besides just the, the, the processes. It's just a, a different way of living. Excellent. Back to the crowd. I'm just curious. Um, has anybody seen the uni ovens out there? Raise your hand if you're cooking with an uni oven at home, right? Great technology, huh? Raise your hand if you're just cooking with a regular old home oven with a pizza stone. Also good. Raise your hand if you're cooking with electric ovens. Anybody? Raise your hand if you're cooking with gas. Very good. Raise your hand if you know whether the flame on your gas oven is from the bottom or from the top. By the way, he's scouting which next uh, uh, video Zoom school he has to do. That's why it's like, no, okay, no, no. you I go to that one, you go to that one. <laughs> no, I'm just curious because I, I, well I never... Well played. What's that? What's that? Well played. Well played. Well played. No, I'm just curious because I, I like to know who's in the room, right? And so what I've noticed in the last couple of years is that a lot of people have gotten into pizza making. Raise your hand if you've gotten into pizza making in the last couple of years, right? I mean, that's, that's one of the blessings of COVID, right? A lot of people, for whatever reason, had baking and sourdough and pizza making on their bucket list. Raise your hand if you never baked or didn't know anything about sourdough until COVID came along and you were stuck in your apartment or your house, right? So, you know, we, we got to count our blessings. Uh, so let's see. 
Uh, we're not going to take questions yet. That's gonna, we're going to save some of those for the end. I wonder if you guys have any questions for the crowd. No, I, I'm the only one. Aren't you curious who these people are? Raise your hand if you're a professional uh, chef. Raise your hand if you call yourself a beginner. Pizza or bread maker. Intermediate. Equal amounts uh, beginning. How about advanced? Any advanced? Yes. Come on, don't front row here. Right? Raise your hand if you've been cooking with sourdough recently. Wow, that's a lot. Raise your hand if you even care or to know what a pre-ferment is. A pre-ferment could be a biga, a pouliche. How about you guys? Anybody use a pre-ferment? Evan, what do you use? Uh, no comment. Come on. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, All right. Raise your hand well, if which you... Which dough? Well, okay. Let's, let's, let's talk about one of your bread doughs that everybody's in love with, there's, including There's me. no shame in the yeast game. Yeah. What oh, about no. your sfinchone? Tell sfinchone. us the secret of sfinchone. Yeah. Oh. Come on. Yeah, every, anybody us. had his sfinchone before? Oh, my God. Evan, tell us. What, what's the secret? Why does everybody... <laughs> wait, wait, what is the secret? Say, guys, the secret is love. No, tell us the recipe, Evan. I know he's not going to tell us. We know he's no. not going to tell us. Uh, honestly, the secret was five years of tinkering. Like tinkering and tinkering and tinkering because I had a sfinchone in Palermo that changed my life. But it was heavy because when you eat sfinchone in Palermo, you can't eat anything afterwards. Like, you're done. You might as well go to sleep. So I took this and I had it in my mind how I wanted it to taste and feel the experience and the flavor profile, but I wanted to make it lighter, as light as I possibly could so that it was almost like encapsulating air inside of gluten matrix. Yeah, the and first time I had this dough, I told him, you need to buy some uh, little bit of, uh, how you call it, those uh, strings. Because otherwise, this balloon will fly. It's crazy. So light. Very light. So tinkering is one of, is one tinker, of the secrets. Tinker, tinker, tinker. Just like Daniela said, make it what you want it to be. If you have a vision in your mind of what your pizza should be, make that. And don't stop until you're satisfied. I'm consistently dissatisfied with most things in general. And... If I have a vision in my mind of what it needs to look like, feel like, taste like, smell like, I don't stop until I get there. And every one of you is an expert at what tastes good to you, right? You're an expert at what is salty, what is light, what is heavy, what is creamy. Nobody can fuck with that. Nobody can touch that. You should hold on to that and that, let that be the driver to what you want to achieve with the pizza. There is no style. He asked me before, does LA have a pizza style? I said, absolutely not. Pizza should be personal. Personal authenticity is far more important than putting something inside of a box and putting a label on it. As soon as you put a label on it, the art is lost. It's lost. So don't put a label on it. Just fucking make pizza. It's going to be okay. It's like music to me. You have seven notes, you make so many different symphonies and melodies. The same thing is uh, bread and, uh, uh, and dough. You have the same ingredients, but look how many things you can make out of it. So it's up to you guys what you wanted to do. For me, it was very difficult because as an Italian and Neapolitan, I got like uh, so many criticism up from my fellow people in the beginning. And then, uh, you know, all of a sudden, I just closed my eyes and uh, I reimagined uh, my childhood. And I was happy, so I was in a happy place. And that's what I do every day at my shop. And I try to teach the people. Though uh, Noel and me had a long discussion about uh, buying a, a machine, right? Like uh, to make dough. I have six locations and uh, we have nine people now that still mix the dough by hand. And my partners, which are the investors, want to kill me because you know, it's labor in Los Angeles, not that cheap. But we still do it by hand. You, you, you tell me, there is a machine that can do the same thing that you can do right now? I don't know. Maybe yes. But the feeling for me is, is different. It's, uh, I, when I go there and I touch the... And I think me and Evan are very similar on these uh, on this things. Because you, you created an hashtag, so fuck you, pasta machine. I was following <laughs> up. I was following up with the F.U. dough machine. 
So it's the same thing. But I want to feel the dough by hand. Because when you wake up in the morning, even though you follow all the rules in the world, you wake up in the morning and the dough reacts like a five years old kid. Oh, today I'm more active. <laughs> oh, tomorrow I'm going to be sleepy. Then it needs, needs a source of heat. And then it's too much heat. And then there's too much of this and too much of that. You're like, oh my God, it's better if I do twins that I have a dough in the house. So... That's how I approach every day. I just wake up in the morning, I go say hi, and my wife thinks I'm a crazy because I talk with the dough. It's like, oh my God, my beautiful baby. So like, are you dumb? So no, I know because the dough sends fears, but also sends love. It sends that you're there. And the moment you look away, you're screwed. Trust me, you're screwed. And it happened to me today. Today we came with the dough from my uh, restaurant, from my commissary kitchen beautifully proofed, shiny, airy. Then I come over here, it's freaking overproofed. <laughs> then what I got to do? Put it back in the refrigerator because it's so hot and then talk to them, please don't, don't leave me alone. But I, literally, well, that's what I did. That's what I did. The people think I'm nuts. I, and I am nuts. But I love my job. I love what I do. And I love making people happy. Yeah. That's what I like. Excellent. I'm going to tell one quick story, then we'll open up the, uh, the mic to some questions. One of the things that I'm always hoping for, and I've always been hoping for, is happy accidents, right? So I'll tell a quick story. When, one of my first consulting jobs in LA was working for Ori at Bestia. And one of the reasons I wanted to work for Ori is that he had a spiral mixer, and I'd never used a spiral mixer before. And I had just bought a book in Italian by Gabriele Bonci. Uh, he was, uh, he was, he, I guess he was well known in Italy. They called him the Michelangelo, right? of pizza, but in LA, never heard of him. And he was doing something called a high hydration dough. And I wanted to make high hydration dough. And he said, oh, he uses a spiral mixer. So I worked for Ori five, six days a week. And then on Mondays when we were closed, I would go in and mix dough. The problem was that his mixer was huge and I didn't have enough room for it. So I would mix a huge batch of dough and stash it in French walk-ins all over town. And then all week long, I would come home and make pizza. And one week, I didn't have enough time to make all the pizza. So I had some dough that was left over for eight days. And I thought, I'm never going to be able to use that stuff. It's wet, it's sticky, it's over-fermented. I plopped it out on the table. It smelled great. I shaped it. It was really sticky, but it looked beautiful. It had all these fermentation bubbles on it. I baked it off. It, came, it rose beautifully. I came out of the oven. I cut it. It was amazing. I texted Ori a picture. He said, bring it. So I brought it to him, and I was really scared to bring Ori. I don't know if any of you know him. He's a scary guy. He's my height, but he's really scary. Anyway... He said, this is the best bread I've ever had in my life. Can you do it again? And I thought, no. <laughs> who, who ferments dough for eight days? But you know what? That happy accident made me realize that time was the secret ingredient that I was missing on, right? And so that happy accident allowed me to realize that really losing control and not being afraid to, to take some chances is sometimes what can get you to like that next phase of development. So I think it's time for us to open up uh, the, uh, the, the floor to some questions, if anybody has any. Uh, yeah. Uh, for 10 years here, I've heard, whenever I'm seeking a new awesome pizza place in LA, I go to a spot, I think the pizza's amazing, and then the person who told me about the secret says, hey, it's because the water was imported from New York, or something like that. So I want to ask you, and it's not just the question about this, I would like to hear some stories if you have them. How important is the water in the dough making process and where you get it from and you know whether it's distilled etc not important there you go. Um, I, I, I think it's not important not in that it doesn't matter but it's not important in that no matter where the water is coming from and what the pH is and how hard it is and how soft it is you adjust and you can still make unbelievable bread and pizza and everything else uh, with that in mind, it's it's uh, those types of things, and been hearing it about bagels in Los Angeles for years, and pizza in Los Angeles for years, and all of those things now exist in really great forms in Los Angeles. It's just about effort, suffering, working hard, getting to a place where you figure it out. If that is what you need to fall back on to to like describe why something is not right or is right. Uh, that is an easy way out. Um, yeah, that's my take. Temperature of the water is far more important than what's in it. That is correct. Final answer? Final answer. And honestly, 
the yeasts and the natural yeasts that are on your body, all of you have natural yeasts, all of your dough, if we were all to make separate doughs, all 80 of you or whatever that is, same recipe, they would all taste completely different because of the natural yeasts that are on you. The more you make the dough, the more the bread becomes a part of you. That's why when you take a starter from San Francisco, ooh, I got the starter like eight years ago and from matter. San Francisco. None of it matters. None of it matters because eventually the natural yeasts that are floating around in this place are going to taste yeah. like this place. That is true terroir. Terroir is not just for grapes, people. It's for bread. It's for you. Mm -hmm. It's for fruits and vegetables and everything. Bread has terroir. And the natural yeast will take over no matter where you bring the starter from. So shower more often, guys. Daniele, your, your skills are, are you, have you been on TV lately? You be a comedian. You're so comfortable now. I love life. I love people. <laughs> I love being happy. What's wrong with that? Let's give it up for Daniele. I, uh, I do one of the most amazing jobs in the world. I get to feed people. Damn right. So Massimo Bottura said, cooking is an act of love. Yep. And I love being alive. My scare to die tomorrow. So every day that I get, I wanted to spend being happy, and I wanted to make people happy, laugh, and uh, joy, you know. And uh, yes, it's right, you know, temperature is more important than everything for dough uh, and, and for everything. But, you know, even shower too. You know, if you guys want to take a shower, we are there. It's fine, and make dough, so you make sure that everything is correct. But jokes, jokes on the side, guys. Uh, it, it's always going back to the same thing. Just do it. Do it and uh, try different flowers. You know, there's a lot of things uh, 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 that are different between each uh, brand of flower and other. And go always for small producers. Right now, there is an industry. There is uh, uh, you. You might see different package, but I'm telling you, inside that package is the same flower because they buy uh, uh, they buy big big uh, bunches and they put it to fill their flower. So if you go to small grower, uh, small millers, you understand more about how they grow their grains. And two, it's fucking cool because you get to see the whole process. You know, the, 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 from the moment that it goes into the ground, then it goes into a miller, sprouted, you're going to understand so many other things. and going to make your pizza game even more advanced because you're going to understand even more about it. Beautiful. Any more questions? Front row here, Advanced Baker. Yes, ma'am. Instead of that 100 to 110 Fahrenheit, I've been experimenting with cool temperature. But what is cool? Is it room temperature? Is it out of the fridge? I mean, I usually put in the dough into the fridge to proof. But the water that I'm starting with, what is cool temperature? It's a complex answer, I think. Uh, it depends on what, what equipment you're working on. Spiral mixer versus planetary. How much friction heat are you adding? How long is your mix time? So you can start with 49 degree water with a super high hydration and you really need to beat the shit out of it to create the gluten structure. It's gonna create a lot of friction, uh, friction heat. So you might end up with a 75 degree dough at the end of it. And once it's past 75, it's off and running. It's going. So if you wanna start with Low temp, he's the king of low temp. Slow rise, so you should talk to him about that because I don't mix anything over 12 minutes for pizza. 12 minutes and under. One of the things I would suggest, we'll get to the next question, Gary Kleiner's next. Um, one of the things that I would suggest is to keep a dough journal, right? What is the temperature of the room? What is the temperature of the flour? What is the starting temperature of the water? What is the starting temperature of the dough? What is the final temperature of the dough? The difference between the starting temperature and the final temperature is your friction factor. And so if you keep a, a journal going and see, you'll be able to see certain patterns. That's, that's what I recommend. Jerry, you got a question? Favorite Chicago pizza, favorite East Coast pizza? Anybody? Chicago? Eesh. I don't know if that, uh, this, uh, that's, a, that's like a pie, you know? I think Spacanopoli is very good Spacanopoli, good one. Ne and Neapolitan. And if it's East Coast pizza, Una Pizza Napolitana all the way. UPN. Anthony's a fucking king. You should go there. Una Pizza Napolitana. 
I, I can't speak to Chicago, I'm going to be honest. But I, I, being from uh, New Jersey and growing up in New York, um, Dom DeFara is no longer around. Uh, Dom from DeFara is no longer around, but that was the archetype for me. Um, Star Tavern um, in New Jersey is the New Jersey version, but I think the ultimate is New Haven and Pepe's. I, that, that is... Coal Fire adds that flavor, and they, I feel like everything is just perfected there. Yeah. I've never been to Chicago. Hopefully I will go when I have a day off. Uh, you know, but I, I had version of uh, Deep Dish Pizza over here, and uh, uh, it, it reminds me more of uh, like a crostata than is a, is a pizza, because it's layered with different flavor. You know, nothing wrong with it. You know, I, I, I eat it. I enjoy it. Only one slice, though, because I cannot eat the whole thing. Uh, but in New Jersey, there is uh, a great friend of mine, Dan Richer, from Razza Pizzeria. He's uh, the equivalent. He's the reverse of who I am. He's all about numbers, uh, technique. Uh, analyzing everything that moves and breathes and hairs in the air. And for some weird reason, we are best friends. We, he talks number to me and say, dude, you can go ahead and talk numbers until the end of the days. I will never understand you. But I love his pizza. I love the end product. And another pizzeria, also in New York, I can tell you that I like is uh, L'Industria. To me, that makes one of the best slices in New York. L apostrophe industry. Yeah, L'Industria. You took my answers for New York. And for Chicago, let me make a recommendation. There's a guy named Kenji Lopez-Alt. Anybody heard of him? Yeah, he just did an awesome uh, piece in the New York Times about tavern-style Chicago pizza. It's the thin crust version. So uh, Google that guy. And he, he, he's an obsessive compulsive like crazy. He spent like a half a month running around, talking to everybody. And he really compiled the list of all the recipes and techniques for home bakers. So Kenji Lopez-Alt, check out the New York Times piece or just Google it. A lot of really cool recipes. So unfortunately, we were running out of time. I want to thank uh, these three gentlemen here for um, hanging out with us and discussing dough. I want to thank you all uh, for coming. I don't know if Steve is still here. Thank you, Steve Delinsky, for coming from Chicago and uh, helping us to celebrate LA pizza. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I'll be at the booth next door if anybody has any questions. If anybody's interested in doing any of my classes, 20% off for the month. Discount code VIP20 if anybody wants to take the beginning, intermediate, or advanced class. Thanks again, everybody. Bye.